That was fantastic, Ben. Thanks very much. Our next speaker, speaker is Dr. Andy Pybus. Andy is a, consul a consultant cardiothoracic anaesthetist from St. George Private Hospital. Um, he has been a computer programmer for many years and has a particular interest in medical simulation systems, the real-time analysis of physiological data, and the use of smartphones during anesthesia. Welcome, Andy. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the use of mobile computers and smartphones in conjunction with anesthesia delivery systems. And basically, I'm going to try and answer two questions for you. <clears throat> Firstly, I'm going to tell you how you can get data out of anesthesia delivery systems in real time. And secondly, I'm going to tell you what you can do with the data once you've got it. When I came over here, I passed this road sign, and I'm afraid the nature of the talk is such that a little bit of geek speak will creep in, but I promise I'll try and keep it as small as possible. I have a conflict of interest, which is that I own a software company, but none of the applications which I show you uh, today are for sale, and they all use use public domain algorithms which are freely available on the internet and which I can supply source code for, should you wish. I thought I'd start by saying a few words about monitoring. When I started in anesthesia in the early 70s, the monitoring paradigm, if we can call it that, was what I refer to as the XY paradigm, with the value the variable to be measured on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. Now that's actually a very old paradigm. It was invented by Carl Ludwig in Germany in the 1840s, but it's persisted largely unchanged to the present day. I'm here to tell you that the monitoring paradigm is about to change radically. Why is this? And the answer is, quite simply, because we're entering what we might call not the age of Aquarius, but the age of the Internet of Things. I'm not sure if all of you will have heard of the Internet of Things, but what we mean by it is the interconnection via the Internet of computing devices which are embedded into everyday objects, enabling them to send, receive, and distribute data. In 2017, the population of the world was about 7.5 billion people. And 2017 is the first year in which there are more devices connected to the internet than there are people in the world. There are 8 billion devices connected to the IP6, the latest generation of the internet, at the moment. And by 2020, there are projected to be 25 billion billion devices. The address space of the internet is now so large that uh, it's possible, if you want, to ascribe an IP address to every atom in our galaxy. And inevitably, the IoT is going to change the way in which we see the world. We have to change our perspectives. And as an example of perspective change, well, this is a simple example. But a more relevant example is that when you look at this slide here, you might see a nice car, it's my Porsche actually, but in fact it's not a car, it's a computer which has been optimised to take you from A to B. Similarly, this is not an anaesthetic machine, it's a computer that's been optimised for anaesthesia delivery. And finally, this is not a phone, this is a computer that's been optimised for communication. Everything in the future will be on the internet. I'll make two points about it, though, which you have to understand regarding the IoT and anaesthetic practice. The first is that all monitoring devices can make their complete data sets available to the user in real time. And the second thing to understand is that 
it is regulatory constraint rather than any lack of te technology which is the main impediment to the advancement of monitoring techniques. How do we get the data? Well, you use what are called wireless serial modems. The cheapest of these costs about 50 US dollars. They're widely available. They're simply, simple to program. They come in all sorts of flavors from Bluetooth through Wi-Fi through 4G, the 4G telephone network. And you simply attach them to the monitor port, uh, uh, the monitor's data port. So in this example, I've at attached a, a pointer. I've at uh, to the uh, anesthesia machine, I've attached a Bluetooth serial modem, which is streaming data to a mobile phone, which is then selecting data selecting the variables that it wants to plot and creating a user interface. In this exa particular example, it's actually performing quite a complex analysis as well. It's doing what's called a fast Fourier transform in real time, but I'll show you more about that shortly. Um, so just to say a few words about the different flavors of modem. They all have different ranges and uh, different utility, as it were. At one end of the spectrum, there are some that work only over a few centimeters, whereas at the other end of the spectrum, if you connect one to a satellite phone, you can send a signal off into space. Okay, so we understand now that we can acquire data in real time on our smartphone and we can have our smartphone process the data. What then can we do with it? Um, the first thing we can do with it is clearly display the data locally on the phone. And I've shown you that slide before. In this slide, you can see I've clamped a mobile phone just above the pressure transducers, the patient's heads here. This is a mobile phone and there are the pressure transducers. And the phone is receiving the data via Bluetooth from the monitor which is behind me. The other thing you can note is that I'm only displaying one waveform there. The reality of mobile phones is that the user interface space is quite small and when you start plugging in lots of waveforms, it gets a bit confusing. So in this particular application, I allow the user to swipe between the waveform variables. The second thing you can do with data once the phone has it is to record it. And what you must understand is that although it's big data, you can get an awful lot on a mobile phone. I do about 250 hearts a year, and ballpark, that would be something about uh, 1,100 hours of anesthesia in cardiac surgery a year. And I can get 10,000 hours onto a single 64 gigabyte, um, gigabyte micro SD card that goes in this phone. So you can get a lot of data. Once you have the data, it's useful to examine the way in which you can use it. And if you think about anesthetic records, essentially we have three ways of, of re-examining, revisiting our anesthetic records. The first one we can revisit is the paper record. And this is actually one of my records of a, pa a patient having some a catastrophic cardiovascular collapse, which was almost certainly a carcinoid crisis. But the point is that you don't, you're not able to record all that many values on the record. Typically, I record about 50 to 100 values per hour, and it's a very limited usefulness in morbidity review. If you go the next step to a computer-generated record, that's much more useful. You'll get between 100 and 1,000 values per hour, and it can certainly be used in, in morbidity review, although I'd have to say they tend to restrict the way in which you can display the information, and you can see here it's a somewhat confusing printout. 
In contrast, when you have a complete anesthetic record on your phone or on your computer, you can, if you want, play back the entire anesthetic in real time. Furthermore, you can easily integrate the data from the anesthetic delivery system with other electronic devices. You can, if you have an interest in smart alarms, which is one of my interests, you can use real data for the development of alarm systems. But finally, and more importantly, these sort of databases are very amenable to complex analyses. And I'll talk about this shortly, but what I've done here is illustrated the effect of a small dose of aramine on um, the arterial elastance of a patient. Now, I'm going to explain it in a few minutes, but what I wanted to show you on this display was that, oops, that I'm use, I, I've used the phone to create a three-dimensional plot. So instead of just having my traditional X, Y axis, I've got a third dimension. I have frequency spectrum at the bottom. I have pressure, blood pressure up the side. And in the Z dimension, I've got whatever it is, I've got time. I'm now going to say a few words about remote data display because once you get it onto the phone, you can then broadcast it somewhere else. By far the most useful thing, which, which I find, and I, I don't do much teaching anymore, but occasionally I have tutes at my house, and you can broadcast from your phone to a high-definition television using what in the Android world, world is called screen mirroring, and it exists in the other worlds too. And it's beautiful. You get, you get wonderful images on high-definition television sets. You can send it over a local area network through your hospital, so you can be in your office watching a, an anesthetic being given. If you really want to, you can effectively make your... Um, patient monitor go at very high speed. Do you all understand that there's one going round us at the moment on the space station? The, that's got a patient monitor on it, which is used quite frequently. I've been experimenting with a slightly different way of making monitors go fast, and I can make a monitor do at least 180 kilometers an hour now, which is by inserting a 4G modem into a patient monitor, which essentially gives it a telephone number, and then ringing the monitor from my car and using what's called mirror link technology to display the monitor on the center console of the uh, car. And so you can, that, that recording I got underneath Sydney Harbor. I'm now gonna talk about one of my two real interests, which is firstly about smart alarms. The first thing to say is why do we need them at all? And the answer is because the world is very complicated. And certainly in cardiac anesthesia, this is my world. As you can see, I've got, what, six LCD screens to look at, and it's a messy, complicated world, and things are happening all the time, and it's very hard to be on the ball. So I'm devising what I call smart alarms. What do I mean by them? I mean it's an alarm which will run on your phone, which can integrate data from multiple sources in real time, which can recognize past trends, which can predict future trends by the implementation of real-time computer models, which can recognize patterns, which can interpret rules, uh, for execution of the alarm, and which can present the alarm state effectively. And I'll talk about that in a minute or two, but as I'm particularly interested in presenting the alarm state as an icon in my visual field. One of the main features of patient alarms is that, in my view, is that they should have context sensitivity. In other words, it's not enough that an alarm triggers after a certain condition is met. Rather, it's better that the alarm triggers when 
a certain condition is met in the correct context. And in a more complex form, I'm trying to develop a system where alarms trigger when an expert system, which is reviewing all of the data, decides that things are going out of whack. To give you an example, firstly, of a very simple computer, uh, apnea alarm, the typical apnea alarm will trigger after the passage of a certain amount of time if a respiratory effort hasn't been made. If you give that alarm some context, you may want to give it a rule which says, look, if the patient's end tidal CO2 is low, we can let the alarm run a bit longer before we trigger, rather like this. Or if the patient's end, CO, uh, end tidal CO2 is high, we can make it trigger earlier. And that's what I mean about context sensitivity. All alarm systems, in my view, in the f well, not all, but many alarm systems in the future will be implemented in part using augmented reality and icon, iconic displays. Why do we need iconic displays? Well, again, it's because the world is complicated. This is the um, cockpit of the Concorde, which was, well, the cockpit was probably designed in the 60s. And you can see it's an incredibly complicated environment. This is an A380 Airbus, which is a much more up-to-date environment. And you can see they've greatly simplified the, the um, environment. And they've implemented at least quite a few, in fact, iconic displays, of which two of the important ones are the, um, these indicators here and here, which are duplicated. I've been experimenting with four iconic alarm systems, all of which I've stolen from other professions, as it were. Um, the icons, as far as I'm concerned, should attempt to convey complex data concisely. They should be able to be rapidly, rapidly assimilated. They must present themselves on a small user interface. They should be updated at a high frequency, and they should be unobtrusive to others. I've looked at four uh, icons. The first one is borrowed from the nuclear power industry and is called the hexagon display. And essentially what it does is it attributes, it, it puts a scalar value on each vertex of the hexagon. And as the value changes, so the vertex moves and the hexagon changes shape. It may also be made to change color as well. It, in practice, it doesn't work very well under anesthesia because things are changing too quickly, but it does work quite well on bypass, uh, and it's a very good indicator of the steady state. The other three icons I'm going to demonstrate to you um, using video clips, um, but the three are one I've borrowed from an aircraft, which is a final glide slope indicator. I've borrowed a fuel gauge from... Um, a vehicle dashboard, and I've borrowed traffic lights and added an extra traffic light. Um, how do I use them? I'm sure you've all heard of Google Glass. Well, there are now successes to Google Glass, and I'm using a pair of Epson spectacles, which allow my... I, I, I've had them optically corrected, and you can see this is effectively the receiving, that's the receiving computer there and it talks to the glasses and it puts images in my visual field. It puts iconic images in my visual field. I've had to cook this up because it's actually hard to display, display it in reality as it were, um, but the software driving the icon itself is actually the software used by the little computer you saw before. And this explains the icon which I can see wherever I look in my right upper visual field. The components of it are, it has a central bar which rises and falls with ventilation. 
the height to which it rises, in this case has been set to the tidal volume, you can set it to end tidal CO2. The colour of the bar represents the judgement made by the computer as to the appropriateness or otherwise of the inspired gas. The little green arrow icons rise and fall with systolic blood pressure, flash with pulse rate and change colour with saturation. And actually this is an earlier version of the icon. There's a, a third edition on the current version which is a small ball which rises and fall, falls with BIS score. So without displaying any numbers at all, I can l look at this icon in my visual field and the way I've set it up, provided that all the values are ending up near a central matrix, I know I needn't look at the monitor. I've also showed you this traffic light alarm, which I, I based, I have a background in aviation and in aviation you use, a, you develop an instrument scan pattern, particularly when you're in a steady state. So you get used to going round and round the instrument panel looking at certain instruments in particular. And in my practice it's the same in anaesthesia. I assign mentally four domains to anaesthesia, the cardiothoracic anaesthesia anyway, uh, circulation, oxygenation, ventilation and depth of anaesthesia. And when I'm scanning my monitors I'm, I'm thinking those four domains. So what I'm trying to do is develop an expert system that will examine each of those domains at a high frequency, about once a second, and will decide whether or not the, the, the state of that domain is good, i.e. green, bad, i.e. red, or a bit ho-hum, which is orange. And so when I run it through my glasses, I just see four traffic lights in my right upper visual field. If something goes, if the system thinks that the depth of anesthesia is a bit suspect, it'll show, or in this case very suspect, it'll show a red light in my, in the, the an depth of anesthesia traffic light. And because the glasses are smart, I can talk to them and ask them for help. So if I say, help Epson, it will tell me why it thinks the depth of anesthesia is a bit sus. You can also display these icons on a smart watch. I'm getting close to finishing now. I'm going to talk to you about my real interest, which is uh, real-time data analysis. And I do have to warn you, there is a bit of geek speak here, but I promise it'll, it'll be really quite simple. I'm going to start by showing you a video which I recorded from a tablet phone or a smartphone or something of me performing an actual experiment and I'll talk you through the video. I'm trying to develop a system that will tell me how my patient will respond to volume loading. Now, if you look at the textbooks, this graph shows you very clearly how patients respond to volume loading, except it's sort of kind of not super clear, it's a bit complicated. You can actually simplify it somewhat by asking yourself, what's my patient's preload reserve? What's the, his or her contractile reserve? And what's the relationship between the two? Because that'll tell you what the response to volume loading will be. So I hope my next slide is, yeah, the way in which I do it. And I'll talk you through this. Traditionally, uh, pulse pressure variability is analyzed in the time domain uh, to, and is used in the assessment of the response, likely response to volume loading. I'm doing what's called a fast Fourier transformation and I'm analyzing a pulse pressure wave in the frequency domain, and I'm displaying it in this center graph as a frequency spectrum, and I'm particularly interested in these two peaks, and the larger of the peaks represents the, if you like, the 
uh, ventricular contraction during asystole, and the smaller of the peaks represents the additional increase in stroke volume that's engendered, that occurs when a ventilator inflates. Because if you imagine it, what happens is the ventilator is inflating and uh, deflating periodically. Every time it inflates, it squeezes an additional amount of blood into the lungs and the blood pressure goes up. I've been exploring that relationship and in fact what I found is that there is a perfectly linear relationship between the delivered tidal volume and the, if you like, the amount of pulse pressure variability as accurately measured by the by spectral analysis, by the fast Fourier transformation. And you'll see here now, this illustrates the linearity. What's happened is over the minutes when I was speaking, I increased the patient's tidal volume from about five to about nine or 10 mils per kilo. And the pulsatility of the waveform increased and it increased in a linear fashion. And what I'm really interested in is this slope because the steeper that slope is, the more responsive to volume loading your patient is. And the better, if you like, what you might call ventriculo-arterial coupling is. The better able to handle an increased volume load the heart is. So this is what I'm interested in measuring, this slope. And I've now measured it, I've been doing it for about two years, so I've done about 500 odd patients. And I've found very consistently this very linear relationship between increasing tidal volume and this funny ratio, the spectral peak ratio. And I've found that when you have a steep slope, you're responsive to fluid. When you have a flat slope, you're irresponsive. And I've found consistently a very high, when you do a regression analysis, R squared typically comes out at 0.95 or something. I've got one minute left, oh, I'll be quick. So if you load a patient with fluid, what happens is this, before you load them, you see the blue line, after you give them 200 mils of albumin, you get a flatter line. They've moved up their slope, up their frank starling curve slope. Essentially what I believe I'm measuring is, is the frequency domain analog of what is called arterial elastance. I've got many more numbers than this now, but I've been able to show quite clearly that when patients have no gradient, they're unresponsive to fluid, and the steeper the gradient, the more responsive they are, so that this shows you moving up and down your curve. I've also been able to show, oh, th this just quickly is the effect in a single patient of volume loading them with 350 mils of albumin. And you can see elastance falls. I just want to show you one last thing. You can actually simplify it. I can't go into the maths now, but you can actually put on a watch an indicator which shows you're either empty or full. Um, I won't show you the, the la I won't go into the last bit, I'll conclude. In my view, um, mobile computing devices are gonna be hugely important in the way we monitor patients. They're very well suited to data management of all sorts, and I think that's all I've got to say. Yeah, there's a new world order ahead. Thank you very much.